Hi, everybody. Hi. Thanks so much for coming today. Um, I'm Ryan. I'm with the Center for Internet Society here at Stanford Law School. Um, I just wanted to quickly uh, introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Sonia Katyal, who is a law professor at Fordham. Um, I am a huge fan of Sonia's work. I mean, it, it seems like she can't seem to write anything without it winning an award. <laughs> I mean, look through her, her bio, and it's just some fabulous stuff. I, I particularly recommend um, her book, uh, uh, Property Outlaws, which is just a really interesting discussion of um, some of the um, sort of surprising advantages of not uh, enforcing the full level of, of property law, both in intellectual and, and real property. Um, and, uh, but, and, and also, uh, uh, very much uh, look forward to her talk today, um, which actually focuses, it's called Contraband, and what it focuses on and uh, it is to some extent um, the ways in which um, the interplay between corporations seeking to control their brands and artists and others um, seeking to, to play with the themes there and, and, and the kind of way in which the law mediates that, that interaction. So we're extremely excited to have her here and uh, I'm really happy you all could make it. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sonia. Um, thanks again. Well, thanks so much. <laughs> that was an incredibly nice introduction. Um, I'm glad it's on tape so I can show it to my mother. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk uh, today. I'm, I'm just thrilled to be able to, to, to come here um, because so much of the inspiration for this project actually began when uh, I was working here as an associate um, uh, in San Francisco um, at Covington and Burling now over 10 years ago, um, so a really long time ago. Um, uh, but some of the things that I was thinking about then, I continue to be thinking about, and it's interesting to see how they've developed. Um, so this book uh, called Contrabrand, which is not to be confused with the Mark Wahlberg movie, uh, similar name, um, uh, <laughs> explores, although it might be nice actually to have some like with confusion with the film, but anyway. Um, it, Who would Sorry? Who would play it? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a great question. In fact, we could spend the next hour discussing that, but um, sadly, um, uh, <laughs> I'll turn more to uh, trademark law. So this, so this project actually explores the tensions um, between freedom of speech, artistic expression, and trademark law. And this book is actually written for a, um, a mostly non-legal audience. So those of you who are familiar with trademark law, trademark principles, will actually find a lot of this to be very familiar. Um, uh, this book is actually written for the average person who's sort of interested in branding and maybe art but doesn't know a great deal about the laws that govern advertising. Um, and I should say that a lot of this project is actually influenced by the work of Andy Warhol, and I'm particularly grateful uh, 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 not only for Andy Warhol's work, but also uh, the fact that the foundation um, actually provided some of the funding to, to make this book possible. Um, so my talk today is actually going to focus on sort of the intersections between art and law um, and between property and advertising and freedom of speech and I'll really uh, look forward to hearing your thoughts and your questions as I kind of describe how the book has taken shape. Um, it basically has three different parts sort of loosely defined. Uh, the first part of the book is really about the rise of, of the brand. Um, in uh, commercial culture. The second part of the book is about the rise of the anti-brand, uh, what I call the anti-brand. And the third part of the book is really um, about kind of exploring some of the deeper constitutional um, collisions between sort of political speech and commercial speech. In July 2007, the exterior wall of the Birmingham Art Museum displayed a haunting image the image. Um, and in its center was a photograph depicting a classic ma MasterCard advertisement with a few central differences. Rather than the traditional picture of a gleaming happy couple embarking on an adventure, there are some things money can't buy, for everything else there's MasterCard, the photograph displayed a radical design scene. And there in the background and foreground ground stands an African American community of varying ages surrounding a father and mother, clad in brim hats, glasses, and overcoats, leading devastatingly, longingly, over a funeral casket. And the familiar MasterCard logo sits at the lower left corner. And the text, scattered across the image, reads the following. Three-piece suit, $250. New socks, $2. Gold chain, $400. Nine-millimeter pistol, $79. Bullet, 60 cents. Picking the perfect casket for your son, priceless. 
On February 2, 2000, 27-year-old Sangha Willis Thomas was murdered, execution style, during a robbery in front of dozens of individuals outside a Philadelphia nightclub. And he did not resist. He was murdered, apparently, for the thick gold chain that was worn by the friend who accompanied him that night. There was no other reason. And this project, titled Crisis Number no. One, is a photograph of his grieving family at his funeral. At any other point in history, Sangha might have become just a, another part of a sobering and yet monolithic set of statistics. After all, African American males are six times more likely to be murdered than whites. But it happened that the photographer, Hank Willis Thomas, Sangha's cousin, roommate, and best friend, had decided that Sangha's memory would stand for something else. And so he created this image, photographing his own family at the funeral, grieving over the loss, and juxtaposed it with a familiar slogan made popular by the MasterCard advertising campaign. As one commentator observed, Crisis Number One is a work that speaks mournfully to all who are willing to examine what Christless really means. Now, after the Birmingham Museum acquired the photograph, it was actually displayed on an exterior wall. And almost immediately, the piece actually sparked a citywide controversy because many of its residents actually thought that the photograph was an actual MasterCard ad that disparaged African Americans. It looked just like a regular MasterCard ad. And was it meant to be that? Or was it meant to be a parody? Was it meant to be something else? The community was confused. And the local reporter, who was initially offended by the image while driving on her way to work, actually wound up kind of breaking the story that this was actually a legitimate piece of art. And so to respond to the controversy, the artist, Hank Willis Thomas, wrote um, in op-ed and explained in the 80s and 90s, a lot of young African-American men were getting killed over Michael Jordan sneakers. And today they're getting killed over gold chains, books, and words. And if Sangha had died for a piece of jewelry, Thomas explained, Crisis number one ensures that the image of his grieving family will live forever in our collective memory. It is this idea, Thomas expressed, that someone could be killed over a tiny commodity. I want to question what makes these commodities so precious that they are worth defining, and more importantly, taking another person's life. Now, the intersection of advertising, race, and consumerism is an issue that has long concerned Thomas, who's a gifted photographer whose work has won both critical and popular acclaim. In another project from the series, titled Branded, he juxtaposes the image of a black male with a series of Nike swoosh logos, drawing a connection between how slaves were branded as a type of ownership and how we brand ourselves. A testament to the kind of power of advertising to draw a subtle and powerful connection between the branding of slaves and the way in which we ourselves undertake the same task. Another one of his pieces, Absolute Power, um, takes the familiar image of an absolute vodka bottle and superimposes a middle passage slave ship inside its outer ring. And the implication between the ad is a simple question. Who is enslaved and who holds the actual power, the company or the consumer? And so interestingly, even though Thomas's art artworks display incredibly powerful critiques, this is the sort of interesting irony, they also run the risk of falling within a gray area between legal and sort of gray areas of expression. Now, according to the Supreme Court, artistic expression is entitled to the highest possible First Amendment protection, equivalent in power and protection to that of the purest political speech. But actually, that picture suddenly changes when brands enter the fray. So while the law normally protects the freedom of individuals to speak and to express themselves, those freedoms actually stop short when they conflict with the intellectual property rights of others, particularly where logos and brands are concerned. And so in the past, advertising agencies once possessed an amazing power to construct public tastes. But today, every brand and every, every advertising message is now open to reversal by the very consumers that they target. So just as agencies spend millions to assemble advertising campaigns to appeal to the everyday consumer, Artists and activists like Thomas can readily reverse their power in equally devastating critiques. And so the clash between the two symbols, the brand and the anti-brand, generates a conflict where the economic value of the brand is often pitted against the political value of artistic freedom, producing what I see as sort of a fundamental impasse between the notion of corporate property and corporate identity and consumer expression. 
So three contemporary cultural moments, I think, really help us to sort of understand the, the context. In the 21st century, one commentator has noted, brands have acquired a place in the world unimaginable than any other period in history. And the branding phenomenon has permeated our global culture, compelling political parties, companies, universities, celebrities, and even nations, right, to focus on branding as an integral part of the symbolic encapsulation of their identity. The laws of trademark protection, which protect brands, logos, and other corporate symbols and advertising, have enabled corporations to uh, consecrate their images uh, until they become almost permanent icons. They become properties rather than images. And so in this period, there's a second sort of cultural moment that's emerged, where many commentators have vociferously decried the growing effect of intellectual properties on our First Amendment freedoms. So particularly, uh, the traditional argument uh, is, is somewhat uh, intuitive, right? Because of the expansion of corporate control, artists and activists have become forced to abandon artistic projects or right sites um, in terms of uh, cyberspace for uh, the fear of being sued for copyright or trademark infringement. And particularly in the commercial context, trademark owners have actually attained a fair degree of success in this endeavor. Um, uh, and so the specter of property rights, one could argue, has really ushered in a period of, of, of sort of self-censorship, where artists and galleries and corporate critics actually wind up getting threatened with lawsuits over sampling of imagery or advertising. Um, and so even though we love parodies, right, it's sort of an interesting thing that you discover as you go through law school uh, that few of us actually realize that actually there is a certain degree of legal risk involved uh, in parodies. And so at the same time that this is the sort of cultural reality or the legal reality, there's actually also a third facet that often gets left out of the picture. And that involves the increasing response of ordinary citizens and artists who have chosen to expand their, their activities past the boundaries of cultural dissent and more sort of readily into the boundaries of what I like to think of as artistic disobedience. So today, aided by the power of digital media, you have thousands of artists and activists and ordinary citizens across the world, the internet, who reverse the power of advertising. Um, so in 2006, at the sort of height of this kind of remix, um, Advertising Age uh, named the consumer as its agency of the year. And just a few days before that, Time Magazine had actually done the same thing, it had named the consumer as its person of the year. And this year, Time Magazine person of the year was the protester, right? Um, so in the past, you see uh, this way in which advertising agencies have really ceded a lot of their power to ordinary citizens. Um, and so what's sort of interesting here is uh, that the most powerful anti-brands actually come directly from citizens themselves. So let me just show you, let me just quickly We'll go back to this, but I just want to talk a little bit about some of the different ways in which people anti-brand, right? Um, so artists transform, as you saw in the, in the Willis uh, Thomas example, um, artists transform Nike swoosh logos into anti-slavery messages. YouTube, right, enables ordinary individuals to engrave, to engage in creative subvertising, which is known as advertising parodies. Consumers design ripe sites to criticize corporations. Countless activists um, actively repaint and subvert billboard advertising. And so all of these different ways in which anti-branding takes place actually, I think, signal sort of a deeper war, a kind of interesting culture war, between uh, powerful corporations who own valuable brands and between the artists and sort of ordinary consumers who actively uh, and cleverly subvert them. So I use this term anti-branding to kind of describe this phenomenon. Um, and so uh, let me give you some examples of uh, some of the ways in which anti-brands have been affected by the product. So um, this is a photograph by an Indian photographer, Shar Haksar, who uh, was actually, it sort of looks like a very uh, sort of innocuous photo, but um, it was actually a commentary on uh, the uh, middle of the serious drought that was taking place in Chennai, India. And so he photographed this as a sort of commentary on kind of the ubiquity of Coca-Cola ads and actually got a cease and desist for it. And as you can see, the sort of tech aspects of this phenomenon are pretty obvious. As tech 
technology increases brand interactivity, there's obviously greater likelihood that consumers and activists are going to utilize these messages and create messages that companies disagree with. So even something as sort of uh, as as sort of not objectionable as a photograph like this actually winds up raising uh, uh, the attention of Coca-Cola's lawyers. Here's another one that's a little bit more um, direct, right? Uh, this is uh, this is a creation of an artist named uh, Nadia Plessner who uh, tried to create. She sort of used this photograph and tried to create a commentary uh, on Darfur. Um, and this was actually meant to be on a t-shirt to sort of raise uh, funding and raise attention to the, uh, to the famine in Darfur. Um, and Louis Vuitton uh, uh, took offense to this and actually wound up filing suit in France. And the case actually eventually settled. But Louis Vuitton has been pretty vociferous, as you might know. Uh, the Hangover 2 was recently the subject of uh, a cease and desist uh, campaign and the lawsuit that was filed. Some other examples, uh, there was a, uh, a, a gallery show a few years ago in Los Angeles that wound up uh, being closed down by local police due to its aggressive and offensive nature, and it consisted of all of these different recoded logos. Um, and in cyberspace, particularly, you see many, many artists and activists. I mean, my students from Fordham are often uh, getting great jobs actually working for major trademark owners, kind of policing the internet for unauthorized uh, uses, right? Um, and, and they routinely send out letters um, to seeking to squelch parody sites. Um, and this phenomenon isn't just limited to the United States. Activists as far as India and South Africa have received similar threats for their work criticizing various corporations. We've seen Coca-Cola, but we need Carbide, Nike, and others. Now, under these circumstances, actually selling the anti-brand, so marketing the anti-brand, actually turns out to be almost impossible under these circumstances. Um, but even circulating the anti-brand without the desire to profit can be incredibly risky. And so the clash between the two symbols, the brand and the anti-brand, I think generates a really interesting conflict where the economic value of the brand is often sort of pitted against the political value of artistic freedom. And then this, I think, produces this impasse that we see between corporate property and corporate identity and consumer expression. And so what I, I, I tend to think is interesting is that censorship here hasn't really silenced the marketplace of expression, but I think what it's done is it's divided it into two kind of coexisting and somewhat converging spheres. You have one that's kind of legal and formally protected by the laws of trademark and intellectual property, and the other, which is less protected and sort of vulnerable to, cri to criminal and, and even uh, to civil and criminal sanction. And so the difference that I see between these sort of marketplaces of speech, one is protected, one is arguably prohibited, I think actually tracks some of the interesting differences that we see between uh, democracy and disobedience, right? Semiotic democracy and semiotic disobedience. Um, so where does this all start? Well, it all starts, right, with the rise of the brand. Um, and uh, the branding phenomenon, as I mentioned, um, has kind of permeated our, our global culture. Um, you can trademark almost anything today. A brand's words, its shape, size, color, sound, even a brand's smell. Cindy Adams, the revered gossip columnist for the New York Post, trademarked her catchphrase, only in New York, kids, only in New York. NBC's three chimes, the smell of a particular type of rose, the purr of a Harley Davidson motorcycle, the roar of the MGM lion, even the phrase, let's roll, has been protected. As the New York Times reports, even trademark is trademarked. Resistance is futile, paramark Picture, Paramount Pictures trademarked that Star Trekism from everything from pinball machines to wrapping paper. And as some phrases catch on, they get taken. The comedian Jerry Seinfeld may have put yada, yada, yada into the vernacular, but Custom Tees, a Connecticut sportswear company, registered it for clothing and shoes. So everything has fallen into this sort of seductive pull of brand building. Stars like Madonna, Elvis Presley trademark themselves, skylines are trademarked, Buildings like the Chrysler Building and Rockefeller Center, all of these have been fenced off for trademark purposes. The situation, Snooki has tried to trademark herself. Someone's actually trademarked Lynn Sanity, right? I mean, in New York, we're sort of obsessed right now with uh, Jeremy Lynn, uh, Lynn Sanity. Blue Ivy has been trademarked. Occupy Wall Street has been trademarked. 
So as um, all of these brands kind of fall, they sort of move out of the public domain and into the private domain, we've also seen kind of a parallel uh, phenomenon in public space as well. So as public space has also become converted into sort of vehicles of corporate advertising, product placement has kind of uh, raised new forms of sort of power and subtlety. Now one professor, Kemper McLean, trademarked the phrase freedom of expression precisely to sort of make this point that he wanted to sort of claim that he now owns, quote, the rights to one of our basic American freedoms. <laughs> and so, so I think what's interesting here um, is that you see this phenomenon emerging, but then you also see this parallel phenomenon of individuals who frankly are less concerned about the control of trademark law and who actually are really interested in kind of challenging the boundaries of how trademark law regulates this type of expression. So as a result, wherever there's a brand, there's also an anti-brand willing to sort of take its place. So one of the big goals of this book is to really explore how we've kind of come to this place um, in sort of corporate and commercial history. So interestingly, the earliest form of trademarks actually appeared as marks on livestock, but there's also evidence of brands, uh, early brands from Egyptian wall paintings as well. But it was actually when the medieval ages arrived that there was more of a focus on kind of branding enterprise because the guild system relied on a very heavily policed uh, system of personal marks to guarantee quality. And it was really when these marks kind of began to be governed as marks as qu of quality in addition to marks of origin that you see the crown sort of interfering more readily. Um, so you have the first cases of deceit and fraud um, and then you have later this notion of kind of preserving an idea of commercial morality um, but by the mid 19th, by the mid 1800s, courts actually sort of started to kind of slowly do away with the requirement of deceit and fraud, um, and instead really began to kind of abandon the need for a proof of an intent to defraud the public. And instead, what they began to do is start protecting the mark on its own instead, right? Looking at trademark infringement as a type of trespass on property, um, as opposed to a kind of fraud that was committed on the public. And so trademarks themselves, kind of during this enterprise, actually changed from being kind of uh, notations of origin to actually moving towards something that was more ornamental, more aesthetically pleasing. Now in the United States, the rise of trademarks was actually linked to the rise of advertising. So the emergence of advertising agencies in the mid-1800s and the sort of growth of national markets as opposed to local markets really fed into the development of brands. And there was also a great deal of focus at this time on patent medicines, right, heavily marketed to cure a whole variety of social ills and issues. Um, and actually those ads constituted well over half of the uh, advertising revenues around this time. And so I would actually argue that uh, the emergence of the modern brand kind of grew out of what I see as a convergence of corporate and, and personal searches for identity uh, at the start of the 20th century. So we start by looking at one of the most famous brands in history. Um, in 1888, uh, Charles Underwood and Chris Rutt uh, purchased a small faltering mill called the Pearl Milling Company. And they both had kind of high hopes for their procurement, and they tried to kind of create the perfect pancake mix. Um, but they needed something else, they realized. They needed something that would make the product more memorable. They needed a hook, they described. Um, and so their search for a symbol actually wound up in a very unlikely place. It wound up in a vaudeville house in Missouri, where in 1889, uh, Rudd came upon a team of black-faced minstrel comedians, and they were dressed in aprons and red bandanas, and they were performing one of the most popular songs of the day, Old Aunt Jemima. And Rudd was immediately entranced. And immediately he sort of realized that the combination of the song's popularity, right, combined with the hospitable image of the southern mammy, was precisely the image that he was looking for. And so a year later, the company registered a trademark in the Aunt Jemima brand. And this is the most interesting part of the story. They actually began a search for a woman who would play the persona of Aunt Jemima, marking the quote, the first time a living person would be used to personify a company's tra trademark. And so they actually hired a bunch of, of different African-American women. Uh, the first Aunt Jemimas were actually um, ex-slaves, um, and, and, and this practice continued.
continued um, for, um, for almost for, for tens of decades. And all over a hundred years later, you can see that Aunt Jemima actually still survives on the box of Quaker Earth oats. She might be modernized, the bandana's missing, she has these pearls actually adorning her neck, which you can't see. Um, uh, but she represents kind of an image, right? She represents a carefully cropped combination of pancake mix and personhood. She represents kind of a living, breathing brand. And so taking up the story of Aunt Jemima, um, the first part of the book really argues that the emergence of the modern brand really grew out of the convergence of these sort of personal and corporate searches for identity. And so advertising in this context really performs two very contradictory functions. It constructs the identity to the public of a particular corporation, but it also creates a personal type of identity surrounding the consumer, right? And so by inhabiting these two worlds, the world of the consumer and the world of the corporation, you actually see advertising playing a very complicated role in our public consciousness. So according to Roland Marchand, right, who wrote the book called Creating the Corporate Soul, this phenomenon tended to emerge at the end of the 19th century when the corporate world found itself mired in an identity crisis. So despite the 1886 case of Santa Clara, which endowed that business with the legal status of person, corporations were actually regarded in the public eye as kind of soulless entities. And he writes, gone were the days in which the maker of goods dealt personally with the customer and was known and understood by him as man to man. As Vice President Hall of AT&T lamented, the public does not know us, it has never seen us, never met us, does not know where we live, who we are, what our good quality are, good qualities are, it only knows that we are a corporation. And to the general public, a corporation is a thing. And so across the board, corporations had to really overcome these perceptions. And so the goal for them was to use advertising as a vehicle to create this kind of sense of corporate vitality and person. And so entrepreneurs began to infuse advertising at this time with their image and personality, almost like they were sort of running for office. Henry Ford participated in automobile races. Legendary shoe manufacturer W.L. Douglas published ads that showed his picture. King Gillette uh, would photograph his like clean-shaven uh, personage on his ads. The Smith brothers would place their pictures on boxes of, of cough drops. And it was here kind of where the modern brand was born. Now, um, generally, today, advertising and branding has become a multi-billion dollar enterprise. And this, this tendency has really come full circle, right? So Absolute Vodka claims that it's a personality its company president claims is the reason for its success, right? Not its taste. Um, and advertising itself has really moved from being written text to more sort of visual images, right? And this emergence from written to visual really actually emerged right at the start of the 1900s when America was sort of facing this kind of psychological anxiety which came at the turn of the Industrial Revolution. They started focusing more on kind of health and medicine. And if you look into the history of ads, it's really interesting. So the white-coated doctor makes an appearance in all sorts of different uh, product ads. And also during this time, you also see kind of a similar development in trademark law, where it fa follows a parallel transition from kind of language and written text into sort of more visual images and slowly into property. So while early notions of trademark law began, became linked to commercial morality, later notions of trademark law were actually linked to kind of conceptions of property rights instead. So it's really here that the modern brand was born. And in the past, a brand actually played a very limited role. It served to kind of identify and distinguish a certain product. But today, brands, because they're so valuable, actually wind up enabling this kind of convergence that we see between sort of consumer identity and corporate identity. And so today, with the advent of advertising, what the product stands for tends to be more important than what it is. And this inversion between sort of product and brands, I think, precisely what gives rise to the dominance of, trade, of trademarks and logos. That companies don't focus so much on the product anymore, they focus on the branding experience, right? The, the way in which brands become economic, expressive, and identicative at the 
same time for both the consumer and the corporation. But at the same time, there is this problem, this underlying problem of protecting brands as property, which is can you really own language? So many brands and logos actually happen to be taken from terms that we see in our everyday language, right? And they also raise significant speech questions as well. So let me kind of give you an example. Um, one of the uh, one of the sort of big trademark cases, right, uh, actually took place um, around November 1978, when a company called Pussycat Cinema began to show a film called Debbie Does Dallas, which is a pornographic film, and it's about a cheerleader at a fictional high school who gets selected to become a Texas cowgirl. And uh, the story, to the extent there was one, um, was pretty simple, right? Uh, to raise money for a trip, she performs a series of sexual services. And she dons an outfit that's very similar to that worn by the you know, incredibly pure and family-oriented um, Dallas Cowboys truly. <laughs> now, presumably unhappy with the association of its kind of wholesome uh, cheerleaders with such wanton sexual depravity, the Dallas Cowboys uh, filed a suit for trademark infringement. And they won. Right? And what it basically argued was the importance of preserving the purity of its brand against pornographic associations. This is not a case of government censorship, the court blithely observed, but a private plaintiff's attempt to protect its property rights. And so while any trademark owner understandably would be rightly concerned about these unwelcome and unwholesome associations, they also raise very difficult questions regarding the intersection of trademark law, speech, and morality. Right? So even in cases where few consumers would view this film right, and actually think, oh, right, this must be sponsored by the Dallas cheerleaders, right? um, courts can actually wind up finding liability due to this danger of tarnishment right, under, the, under the framework of dilution. And as a result of cases like this, trademark owners routinely patrol the cultural worlds of online and offline entertainment looking for examples that might affect the purity of a recognized brand or logo. And so one example, right, uh, happened in 2004 when a series of threatening cease and desist letters were sent to a gallery owner who actually wound up shutting down the show, right, um, by an artist who depicted a gay relationship between Batman and Bob. Right? And this is not limited, right? Other lawyers have issued a series of legal threats against a filmmaker, a filmmaker whose piece Ernest and Bertram uh, depicted Sesame Street characters, Ernie and Bert, in a domestic relationship. And even toys and telegrams have actually been affected. Right? One court found that the Superman and Wonder Woman singing telegrams have harmed the original trademarks uh, in the characters. So while the problem of trademarks unrestrained power actually began surfacing in the 80s, it's grown even more pronounced in the 1990s, when the law kind of extended itself even further. Trademark law banned union organizers from from using the name of their corporate target. They prohibited gay activists from using the label of the Pink Panthers to describe their organization. They forced a Delta Retiree Association to change its name. And so as brand expansion began to sort of rise to new heights, even editorial content actually wound up uh, raising these kind of gray areas. So at the height of such expansion, a court found evidence of trademark infringement in uh, um, a book uh, called The Cat Not in the Hat, a parody by Dr. Juice, because he used his style that was very similar to Dr. Seuss's style. Um, and so I think what's important for us to just sort of understand is that there has been a real expansion of trademark law, right, uh, into these areas of speech. Um, but at the same time, there has also been, along with this expansion, a real tendency of artists and activists to kind of utilize these uh, these um, the, the sort of tools of technology and the skills derived from remix into trademarking uh, uh, products um, and using brands into this sort of other kind of parallel system of meaning, right? And so that's where we get to the anti-brand. And so as later chapters suggest, this kind of conflict between intellectual property and property and speech, I think really masks a very interesting underlying conflict between different types of markets one being a marketplace of goods, the other being a marketplace of ideas, and the way in which political speech and commercial speech traps each one. <clears throat> now, what's interesting is I sort of tend to look at the anti-brand as this representation of the clash uh, between economic value and social meaning. So this is 
where the two sort of frameworks, I think, really intersect, right? And it, and it really tracks as well some of the other stuff that I've written in the past about semiotic disobedience, right? And how semiotic disobedience uh, both converges on, but then also kind of transcends the notion of semiotic democracy. Um, now, what's interesting about this story, and part of this story changes because uh, the, the project has, has sort of taken on new lives of its own, is, is that actually courts in the last few years have issued a number of decisions that were pretty strongly supportive of uh, anti-brands, right? So in the, in the trademark context in real space, you have a number of artists being protected, right? Uh, particularly in the Ninth Circuit uh, um, from some wonderfully written uh, opinions by Judge Kaczynski. Um, and you also have a number of websites, gripe sites also being protected. Um, and that has led to a real sort of, um, uh, to, to a real celebration, I would see, of the anti-brand, right? So let me show you some examples. Um, uh, this is a classic anti-brand, um, but there's also a number of other ones. And as you can see, I mean, some of it involves reworking trademarks, but some of it also just involves commentaries on the brand. Since we are in, uh, in um, Silicon Valley, I felt compelled to show you some San Francisco-like examples. I don't know how many of you might have seen this uh, this was actually up on Highway 101 a number of years ago. It says, think disillusioned. Um, uh, these are some others. Um, <coughs> this is a very famous San Francisco group that's existed since 1977. Uh, it was actually founded by advertising execs. Um, uh, these come from Adbusters, the founders of, or the originators, one might say, of Occupy Wall Street. Some more examples. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Go too fast. Says, I miss my lung bob, capitalism, compact, indoctrination technology. Uh, this is another series of examples. Now, this one I particularly like on the right. It says, you're running because you want that raise to be all you can be, but it's not easy when you work 60 hours a week making sneakers in an Indonesian factory, and your friends disappear when they ask for a raise. So think globally before you decide it's so cool to wear Nike. And if you look very closely, the N and the I and Nike are really collapsed, which is sort of interesting. I always wondered whether the um, some lawyer advised the makers of this particular um, uh, suffer to, to say, well, you should you should actually collapse the two so that people can tell this isn't actually a legitimate ad. I don't know how many of you remember their campaign that really talked about kind of these celebratory messages of, of athleticism. Uh, this is a this is one that um, is 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 also pretty pretty well known in the sort of anti-brand world. So, um, and this is actually a more recent one that was actually the subject of a, 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 a case uh, in a district court in the South. Um, and what, what is sort of very interesting about this sort of anti-brand trend is that you actually see a situation where some anti-brands are allowed, right? And, and companies won't necessarily send cease and desist letters. But if the anti-brand is linked to something that is incredibly offensive, say like the Holocaust or Al-Qaeda, then actually companies will be more willing to enforce um, uh, their expectations of, of, of trademark protection. So this is one of those cases um, that's more recent. Um, these are some examples of uh, fine artists who have faced similar types of challenges, perhaps not classic cease and desist letters, but uh, this artist has reported that galleries are very uh, they, they don't want to show more work because they're concerned about some of the trademark issues involved. Uh, Tom Sachs, uh, this is actually a Her Hermé grenade and an Hermé box. But Tom Sachs is really well known for doing this sort of thing and he's actually attained such a level of success kind of along the lines of Jeff Koons that he's a little bit less vulnerable. Um, uh, this is the Prada toilet that he created. Uh, this person, Peter Gronquist, um, Louis Vuitton is, is very, um, uh, is, has been a lot stricter than a lot of other luxury brands about the use of their, uh, of their marks. And so uh, this is an example of an artist. I always wondered whether or not the artist had, uh, it's, his work is, is a little bit different to find, so I'm not sure if he's ever been subjected to anything. Um, this is uh, a, a Native American artist who has uh, been using um, 
sort of very traditional, uh, recognizable commercial images to really comment on the appropriation of Native American imagery. Um, this is a Stanford professor, um, so I, I thought it was important to, to demonstrate that anti-branding can be a local phenomenon. Uh, Enrique Chicoya has done some wonderful work uh, talking about the use of commercial images um, and so has his own series of comments on the very ubiquitous uh, Andy Warhol projects. Um, now, so all of these uh, artists, right, engage in some sort of use of brands in their fine art. Um, and you would think, right, that it would sort of be unthinkable that a brand or a company would actually wind up taking offense at this sort of thing. But that has actually happened, right? Um, and there have been a number of cases that have been fairly supportive of anti-branding as a result. So particularly in the Ninth Circuit, right, um, uh, Barbie has been the subject of a number of really interesting cases. Um, and this particular case involved the song um, by the band Aqua. Does anyone remember the group Aqua? This is a song called Barbie Girl. Um, uh, this is a, it's a pretty well-known case, but uh, you'll read it if you wind up taking a trademark or a IP class. Um, but it was about a song where uh, one of the band members uh, impersonates the revered blonde doll, and she sings in this high-pitched voice, and she says, life in plastic is fantastic. You would think that Mattel wouldn't necessarily care, but they actually wound up filing a lawsuit about it, and uh, actually losing before the Ninth Circuit. Um, another case uh, involved the artist Tom Forsyth, another Ninth Circuit case, um, uh, and a uh, Kaczynski opinion, uh, where Mattel again sort of sued on the basis of trademark and copyright infringement. Um, and so these cases actually wind up uh, sort of being losing propositions for some companies, right? So the more interesting question is, if they are in fact losing in the courts, then why is this a problem? Well, I would argue that for every case that establishes kind of this boundary of protection, particularly in the Ninth Circuit, right, as opposed to other places uh, that are a little less protective, there are many more cases where you actually see kind of this low-level sort of cease and desist phenomenon, where uh, lawyers routinely send out letters that are very threatening, right, um, and, and that really aim to kind of uh, police the boundaries between commercial and political speech. So, while these cases, I think, do signal the beginning of a really important legal shift, there's still a lot of other stories that we often hear from artists and activists uh, that demonstrate that they still remain uh, incredibly vulnerable. Um, there's this sort of vast level of informal surveillance that often takes place, um, so it is particularly online, right, where unscrupulous lawyers are all too quick to launch cease and desist letters because they know that in most cases, the artist or the activist will wind up taking the site or um, seizing the activity. So let me just kind of close, and then I'm sort of really interested in hearing your thoughts and your questions about this work um, that I think kind of illuminate sort of where we are now in terms of these tensions. Um, so a few years ago, a University of North Dakota student, uh, Gary LaPointe, who was a college senior, was threatened with infringement when he tried to anti-brand the trademark Fighting Sioux logo. And his organization, which was an assembly of, of Native American students, wanted to appropriate the logo in order to manufacture a series of gold pins. But they wanted to kind of change the gold pins slightly. So instead of keep, keeping the logo, and it's really difficult to see on the right, but instead of keeping the logo, the students planned to mark it with a slash across the front that said time for a change in order to demonstrate their disagreement with the logo's very stereotypical representation of the Sioux tribe. And he explains, there was nothing professional I could wear um, at uh, employment interviews to signal my feeling about the UND nickname, uh, Le Point explained, and he's an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux tribe. So he obviously was significantly displeased with the stereotypical image of the fighting Sioux. And the pin, the sale of the pins were supposed to be accompanied with a paper that read, UND, a great school plagued by a racist name. But after he and his organization placed an order with the company to manufacture hundreds of these pins, the organization was, was threatened with a trademark lawsuit from UND, their own university, right? And ultimately, kind of terrified of losing their savings and, and having some negative repercussions on their college experience, dropped the plan. So consider for a moment what this story suggests. The legal protection that the anti-brand receives ultimately turns on sort of whether or not the speech is construed as political, right, which receives the highest level of constitutional protection, or whether it's viewed as commercial, 
right? And in this context, because the pins were to be sold, right, uh, there's a sense that it received significantly less protection in nature. And so many times, uh, instead of classifying these anti-brands as sort of political or artistic expression, or even commentaries on brands themselves, some courts, right, and certainly many, many trademark lawyers, find these anti-brands to be commercially oriented and therefore unworthy of the same kind of protection that's being given to political and artistic speech. So in the last section of the book, I talk about the need for courts to kind of balance the economic value and the property value of the mark with the kind of social value of the need, um, uh, of the value of freedom of expression. And so I talk about how the law has to kind of recognize the need to balance the commercial sphere with the political one. And I think that this is particularly important when we're in this world of immense brand activity on the internet, right? Where the boundaries, I think, of commercial and non-commercial speech are kind of actively being blurred, not just by consumers who might be selling the anti-brand or using anti-brands in particular ways, right? But also by companies themselves who are, are vociferously trying to kind of expand the boundaries of product placement right, into these non-commercial spheres. And so as those boundaries begun, be, become more and more expansive, you see more and more examples of a level of confusion between what actually, what is speech about a brand by a particular consumer and what is speech about a brand uh, that is sponsored by a corporation. And so the emergence, I think, of the anti-brand, I think, represents the sort of collision, right, of these different uh, categories of commercial and political speech. And I think that it's more than just kind of a hybrid of commercial and political speech. I actually think that it also sort of signifies kind of a culmination of the norms that we have in our society between a value for communication on one side and a value for commodification on the other. And so as this book has suggested, the sort of three-way conflict between intellectual property, property, and speech, I think masks this really interesting tension between these different markets, right? One being a marketplace of goods, the other being a marketplace of ideas. And so I particularly think, right, that anti-branding sort of offers us a really interesting cautionary lesson to intellectual property enforcement. That just as the law might attempt to sort of suppress creativity on some level, Right? It actually gives rise to an even more interesting uh, sort of tra transformation where we actually see some very interesting kind of innovation uh, coming from comment and criticism um, than we had ever actually previously imagined. So ironically, I think it is the sort of cease and desist tradition that trademark law has really sponsored that has led to some of the most so that's the book in a nutshell, and I'm really happy to answer questions. I love your thoughts about the project um, and ideas. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. This is great. Really I'm going to take host, hosting privilege and ask you the first, uh, actually, a couple quick questions for you. Um, and uh, you'll bear in mind I don't um, know all that much about trademark law, so I apologize in advance if these, these are some of the So. One question I have for you is, have, has there ever been a case, one way or the other, that said that um, you might lose your ability to um, claim a trademark because you failed to police it, where the examples involve art? That's my first question. I mean, one way or the other, right? And you can sort of see how that might, might play out. And the second thing is, you know, a lot of advertising is so edgy that, you know, that Hermé grenade, like you could totally see Hermé using that grenade to advertise its own product. In fact, there's a there's an advertisement that's uh, absolute, that's called In an Absolute World, and it depicts um, Times Square, because like all of the ads have been replaced with famous paintings. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and so query for a moment whether we think that Degas and, and endorses <laughs> absolute vodka, but, but imagine that it, that it was, from the context, it was imminently clear that the, the, the person, so for instance, um, tired of bad art, snap into a slim gym, you know what I mean? And so it's like clear that they're not doing you know, anything like that. So what, what result there, where there's an attempt to appropriate by the edgy advertiser of an artist, do you feel different about that? So okay, yeah. these are such great, great questions. Um, so, so let me start with the first one. Um, uh, whether or not there's a case that says that uh, 
that one loses their ability to uh, enforce their trademarks because of failing to enforce it against anti-brand. Well, one of the one of the strongest arguments that we often see from trademark owners is um, that they feel sort of. I mean, their argument has often been that you know we're sort of hamstrung here because if we allow these marks to exist, these anti-brands to exist, we are susceptible to uh, challenges on this basic on this basic argument, right? That there's a failure to supervise, um, you know, uh, that you've abandoned the mark. And so there is this real sense in trademark law uh, that provides this imperative for trademark owners to routinely police the use of their marks and logos. Now, I think that the legal claim that is often raised um, is a little bit, I, it, it seems unlikely to me that if a, that a trademark owner would lose their mark because they detected that some activist someone was using their mark and said, you know what, okay, fine, go ahead. Um, but it is that fear that I think really informs why trademark owners are so heavily uh, focused on kind of policing their marks. What I have seen trademark owners do is issue letters after they find a use that basically implies a certain license. So that there is this still, so that there is this sense that we're still retaining some control or supervision, but we're not, but, but so this takes care of our mark being vulnerable, but we're still gonna allow you to use it. Um, and, that's, and that really just takes place after kind of uh, public opinion or, or you know, an issue of trademark enforcement sort of hits the blogs or whatever, so that trademark owners are less likely to kind of uh, take those risks of sort of silence. I mean, that's one wonderful thing about the internet is that it's not cool, right, for uh, companies to silence uh, criticism about their company through trade, through intellectual property principles. And so if these things hit the blogs, you see trademark owners routinely kind of thinking a little bit more critically. Not so in the case of Louis Vuitton, which does in fact use this argument that, you know, we have to enforce all uses of our marks. Um, the second question, which I think is awesome, Right, about the tradition of appropriating anti-branding um, is actually um, you know, not, to, uh, not to totally plug my, uh, some of the writing I've done on this, but, uh, but actually I wound up, I wrote this article called Anti-Branding and Stealth Marketing, the love that dare not speak its name, because I actually wound up finding all of these fascinating examples of companies that were you know, paying graffiti artists to engage in like blatantly illegal marketing activities, right? And their presumption was, well, even if you get arrested, you know, we'll pay your fine, right? But there's a there's a huge amount of benefit to, uh, you know, spray painting our brand on the sidewalk or engaging in these, you know, like there was an example a few years ago where uh, there was an LED box that kept lighting up in Boston and like basically shut down part of the city. And many people in the city were like, oh, it's just a marketing campaign. And then this just shows you sort of how our public has become so used to anti-branding strategies being used as marketing strategies. And that I think, you know, if there's one thing that I think is really, really complicated um, for this kind of next generation of anti-branding, it's exactly what you raised, right? Because now when you have companies actually sponsoring anti-branding campaigns, it really blurs the boundaries of commercial speech and non-commercial speech, right? Because as companies take more and more activities that go beyond the classic commercial realm and instead utilize product placement in all of these places or engage in kind of activities that look more like anti-branding, the consumer winds up becoming more and more confused, right, as to what is sponsored content and what is it. And that makes it a lot more complicated. Right. Okay. I'm going to drill a little bit further and start this back. Um, you can touch on Angemon or Quaker Oils or anything. I mean, advertisers took stuff from these actors, mm -hmm. and the actors didn't get a nickel for it, and it wasn't infringing on their property. The same thing for the Quakers, they don't get paid. I find all of this really interesting and really absurd, right? Because if you go back a little bit, sure, the Gills had these things, but people were ripping, well, Invention was taking other people's stuff. In the Renaissance, how many enunciations do you see that are identical? Mm -hmm. Nobody was going around saying, you gotta pay me money for this, right? right? And companies like Disney have people petrified to do anything, right? Because Disney is like the time, it works. 
and we use anything that is interconnected. So it seems awfully curious to me that these people basically grab all this stuff, but they're not subject to, as you're saying, with, with people taking artist work, they're not subject to any of the same protection. The artists. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's that that tension is particularly what's interesting here, right? I mean, certainly you're right that there is this there's this long tradition of kind of lack of payment, right, for appropriation. And so amidst that kind of historical tradition, you also have, you know, you could certainly situate anti-branding within that world, right, which, which is appropriating. I'm saying something stronger. I'm saying that invention is based on appropriation. And without appropriation, you have very little invention. Yes, I think that's entirely true. Um, and. You know, I, I do think that like the culture of innovation has always been informed by a certain degree of appropriation. So I, I definitely recognize that. I think that in this particular context, though, when we're talking about artists who are using brands in ways that raise classic First Amendment considerations, like commentary or political speech, the the desire to compensate, I think, is significantly less, as is the impulse to compensate, and also the value that our government sort of makes in kind of investing and protecting this kind of speech is of a little different variety. But I entirely agree that the tradition of appropriation has been deeply informed, right, um, by the kind of innovation that you see, I think, all around us, right? Um, but I, I think that what's what's complicated about the anti-branding story, right, is if we connect this to, to what Brian was saying, that now when you have companies appropriating from anti-branders, and we actually have seen situations where up-and-coming artists will actually see some of their work or themes in their work being used um, by advertising campaigns without compensation, it really raises significant distributional issues. And those, I think, are really difficult because you it turns more on a question of ethics as opposed, as opposed to law, right? Um, in the sense that you don't necessarily want the law to always require payment in every case of, of appropriation because you don't want to dampen or, or squelch innovation. But at the same time, when you see like an up and coming artist, right, who has trouble paying the rent, right, you having their work used by a prominent Nike campaign by Whedon and Kennedy, right? That certainly raises, and so I would say that that's more of an issue of ethics. And, and certainly, like, what's very interesting is, so since I started this work, so I, I wonder if Hank Willis Thomas would agree with me, um, but he started off as, like, not necessarily an underground artist, but he started off as, as somebody who I think was, was lesser known, right, not comparable to, like, Jeff Koons or whatever. But since he has really taken off, since his work has taken off, he actually has been approached by advertising uh, agencies. And so the anti-branding work that he did actually, you know, I think I think has led to some great opportunities, some very complicated opportunities for Hank. And I, you know, he has a whole narrative about how he works out those questions. Yeah. I have a fantastic I mean, very interesting. I want to actually ask a question about the First Amendment values and distributional issues. You talk a lot about the kind of distinction to, or the conflation of the market, the place for goods, the marketplace for ideas. But what's interesting then, what a lot of these trademark owners are doing is that in their kind of corporate competition, they're trading upon social hierarchies, racial hierarchy, gender hierarchies, uh, and. I wonder whether there's actually some room in trademark law to bring in some equality or any subordination principles that may not actually be represented by some of the First Amendment interests that I'm talking about. Okay, um, that's an awesome question. Um, so one thing that I so one of the one of the I guess minor themes of some of the work that I've done touches on a lot of issues having to do with distributional questions about race and sexuality and so on. And I actually find that the area of trademark law is so fertile for us to kind of rethink some of the different classifications that we have. And so one of the ways in which trademark law actually does really address some of these concerns has to do with um, a part of the land map called Section 2A, which cancels marks or provides for cancellation of marks that are immoral, scandalous, um, um, and so on, and so it has been the subject of some very interesting case law, right? The Redskins trademark being obviously one of the most prominent, 
but there have also been some very interesting cases involving sexuality as well. And so I think that there is room in trademark law for instigating some of these anti-subordination principles, and certainly there is more room in that statute than in other areas of law, certainly other areas of property or intellectual property, because you actually have these kind of speech-oriented considerations. But I think what's so difficult about Section 2A, right, is that even though many of us are sort of personally quite offended by certain marks that you know, represent stereotypical images of Native Americans and, and so on, there also is a cost, right, to enforcing those kinds of regulations, right? And the cost is that I think at times the more edgy types of marks, the more edgy types of representations wind up losing out, right? It's a very similar kind of thing that you saw with pornography restrictions, right? Do you, do you think it's because 2A is uh, kind of couched in terms of offense and morality rather than in terms of equality, in terms of equality and discrimination? Yes, I do, I do. And I think that when you use terms like, you know, immoral or scandalous, that kind of invites um, uh, people to sort of think through some of the deepest um, seated uh, uh, concerns that they have with like tarnishment and purity and so on. So I, I really, really agree with that. Um, I, you know, I do think, and maybe I, maybe I predict uh, too readily sort of what I think the Supreme Court will do with based. I do think that eventually the Redskins case is going to come before the Supreme Court. Certainly not in the next few years, but eventually. And I do think that it will be an opportunity for the court to really get rid of the restrictions or the distinctions that it sees um, between commercial and, and, and non-commercial speech. And I think when that happens, areas like Section 2A will become incredibly vulnerable if they even survive. So I think that it, there's a there's a tendency that we have now to think it's so much easier to be First Amendment purists with some of these issues, right? Um, the you know the government should just stay out of issues when it comes to regulating speech, whether it's in trademark law or in other areas of speech. But one of the things that I think is so interesting, right, about the area of trademark law is that so if we're uncomfortable with trademark law, reg, or the government regulating trademarks on these speech concerns. You know, why is it that we're somehow comfortable with the government regulating speech when it comes to license plates, right? I mean, there have actually been some very interesting cases where people, there's actually a really fascinating case um, a few years ago where someone wanted to put HIV pause, right, on their license plate. And the argument that this person offered was, I want to kind of rebrand what it means to be positive, right? I want to talk about how, you know, it's not just a, a you know, a, it's, it's a badge of some form of, of pride, right, in my, in my status and, and to symbolize that. And, you know, a court really struggled with that, right? And so you do see these really difficult cases. Um, and, I, you know, I think some cases are easier than others, I guess, this is one way to respond. But I, I don't know that trademark law will ever get to the place that I think we'd like to see where there is a better formulation of anti subordination That was a really long answer. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question here. If someone has, uh, any questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much. This, this is really great. Thanks so much.